good afternoon, good morning, good evening. So thank you all to join us again for another very interesting talk that we are going to have today by Dr. Irvan Zorian from Synopsis USA. So today is about the safety and reliability challenge in today autonomous vehicles. So Dr. Irvan Zorian is a chief technologist and fellow at Synopsis. Formerly, he was a vice president and chief scientist of uh, Virage Logic, chief technologist at Logic Vision, and a distinguished, distinguished mentor of technical staff at AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, he is currently the president of IEEE Test Technology Technolo Technical Council uh, that also promotes here in Latin America the uh, Latin American Test Symposium. Uh, the, the, and he's the founding chair of the IEEE 1500 Standardization Working Group and an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada. He served as the general chair of the 50th Design Automation Conference, uh, the 5th International Test Conference, and several other symposia and workshops. Dr. Zorian holds 44 U.S. patents, has authored five books, published over 350 refereed papers, and received numer numerous best paper awards. He's a fellow of IEEE since 1999. Uh, Dr. Zorian was the 2005 recipient of the prestigious Industrial Pioneer Award for his contribution to BIST, and uh, the 2006 recipient of the IEEE Hans Carlson Award for Diplomacy. He received a master's degree in computer engineering from the University of Southern California, a PhD in electrical engineering from McGill University, and an MBA from Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. So this is just a very short uh, resume of uh, the large uh, set of achievements that uh, Dr. Zorian got uh, till now. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. And uh, thank you very much again to accept our invitation. So um, I can give uh, now the floor to you to start your uh, talk. So uh, thank you. And thanks a lot, Ricardo. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And particularly, thanks for creating this uh, series of, of uh, talks. Uh, I visited the, the YouTube site. They're exciting. They're quite wide range and, and very uh, prominent uh, presenters and topics. Um, so I'm pleased to bring my contribution to your series as well. And in this case, this, this particular presentation will be related to autonomous vehicles. Uh, to the safety, reliability aspects of them. As you know, we are surrounded by, by change all the time. The only constant thing that we have is change. Particularly during the past one year, we have seen so much change. And in everything we touch, in every equipment we touch in our life, we see change. Uh, smartness and increased smartness as you move forward. And that smartness is in small and large uh, elements of our life. And by doing that, we see that uh, change is not new. We have seen it through the past four decades. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we saw it in the compute world by introducing uh, personal computers after having large computers for a long time. Then the change came to the communication space, networking with the internet revolution and so on. And then we saw the change coming through the smartphones, tablets, and so on, which is the mobility, all the mobile devices that we play with constantly. And then this last decade, our change is more in the AI domain, the 5G in the communication, which is enabling lots of smart equipments to be intelligent, mobile, communicative, and being able to, to, to help us in our natural life. That's where autonomous vehicles come to picture and they can play a big role. And there, the most uh, critical one that we all use are the cars perhaps, all the autonomy that the car is taking over from the driver, which is great because it's, uh, it's using what uh, the, the driver would have done in most of the time. So a large percentage of what the driver would have done has already moved to the, to the autonomous system in the car. But we also see increase in 
in ro robots for, for our personal lives, for our industrial lives, in the factories. We see it in the space, the three-dimensional. So not only the cars, which are two-dimensional uh, movements, but three-dimensional movements such as the drones and so on. Now, what is common among those? What's common is, is the fact that they are fully electrical these days, most of them. Uh, they are also autonomous and they are changing uh, intelligent, that is, and they are changing the style of our life. If I take our cars for, a, for an example, the cars have moved from being uh, proportion based to being uh, electrical based. We have seen the intelligence of the driver in terms of being auto autonomous moving to the car. And also we saw that an impact is already happening on the economy because by having uh, autonomous cars, you can do more sharing of cars and so on. And thus over the long run, impacting the traffic, having lesser traffic, having lesser need to, to parkings, having less congestion in the center of the cities. So all of that is happening in because of the technology that's coming in. And today we'll talk about the technology mostly, not the economic impact or the, the, the implications about it. And what kind of technology is helping us do that? It is the software and the hardware in these autonomous engines. For a car now, today's cars would have a very complex piece of software. We'll have about 100 million lines of code in my car today, which communicates four terabytes of data per day. Even if when you're not driving during this uh, COVID period, the car is consuming lots of energy. Uh, I spend about four miles a day without moving the car. It's because of the multi-terabyte communication that, that's happening between the car and the cloud. So all of these are happening because we have supplied our cars with various electronic systems, from the powertrain to the safety mechanisms, to the self-driving intelligence, uh, to the infotainment. All of those are, are, are different elements that are coming in. And we're seeing the increase in the complexity of the cars uh, from electronics point of view to go up. But from the mechanical point of view, it's being simplified. The new cars are much more simple uh, mechanically. That's why we see uh, new car companies coming up, uh, such as Tesla, uh, for several years now, which is a light car company. Because if you open the car, there's, the, there's much, much less complexity in the mechanics of the car in there. Instead, there's a network of chips. And there is a co constant amount of software which gets upgraded on a regular basis. Similarly, we're seeing many uh, electrical car companies around the world that are popping up. Uh, we see, for instance, the amount of electronics in the cars here, how it has increased from the 50s, where about 1% of the car cost was the electronics, to uh, <clears throat> at the end of this decade, we'll have about 50% of the cost of the car uh, in its electronics. Today, because of the electronics market limitations, we're seeing a backlog, of course. So we're seeing lots of problems because of the supply of the chips to the cars are not sufficient. Therefore, we don't have sufficient amount of new cars these days around us. On the software side, we also see a constant increase in the software, and that will go up as well. So both the hardware and the software are dominating the cost of the car. And <coughs> why is that happening? That's happening because you have uh, intelligence in the car that is needed be in, in every sense, in every system inside the car. And it is getting centralized more and more. In the past, we used to have hundreds of ECUs, controller chips, that were sitting in different corners of the, of the, the car itself, of the system. Today, we have much less ECUs. We are co collecting them and centralizing them. So you have a more intelligent engine centralized, dealing with lots of uh, points around the car to actuate, to, to, to control, and to provide the mechanisms for them. Also, we're seeing complex chips for driver assistance for uh, because of the vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication. One of the newer things, as you know, is the two vehicles talking to each other. Another reason for the complexity is the fact that we're seeing new types of sensors. Uh, the imaging ones, LiDAR ones, radar ones, and so on, and their numbers, okay? So as a result, we also need to have, of course, safety. We also need to have intelligence 
uh, in security, and we'll come to those uh, shortly. Um, one very important component in all of this is the AI aspect. Mm -hmm. Is the AI algorithm being used in various domains of the car? So various chips or various subsystems in the car are using AI as well, and we'll come back to this too a bit later, especially in the ADAS chips and the infotainment chips of the car, mm -hmm. bringing in lots of information from the sensors, but pre-processing them in the car and then sending them to the cloud and we'll see what happens later. Now, all of this is happening because we have the car requirements coming from the OEMs. The OEMs are the car manufacturers. The tier ones are the subsystem suppliers. And then the component suppliers are the ones who provide the chips for the cars. Even though this traditional three, three slice um, structure of this industry is changing also now. Now we're seeing the tier ones uh, the OEMs doing tier one's job, the tier ones are doing their own chips. So, so uh, because of the changes, the recent changes in the car electronics industry, even the major players are, are changing their roles over time. Typically, you would have received the requirements from the OEM to the tier ones, and then the chip suppliers will create the chips. Of course, the chip suppliers will work with the rest of the industry to get uh, the necessary chip design tools, chip designers, chip manufacturing companies, IP companies, and so on, to create the necessary chips for the cars. And we'll concentrate most of the talk today about the chips. But one more thing to remember prior to that is that all these systems that we're talking about are not isolated systems. They are all connected with each other. So the connectedness is also part of this issue inside the car, more importantly, outside the car. The car is connected to the cloud, and we will see that the useful part of that, that is getting AI information from the cloud, but also the dangerous part of that, that is getting uh, uh, security issues, again, due to its connection to the outside world. As a result of that, we see safety, security, and reliability being very important elements in our cars, in all these uh, autonomous vehicles, in fact, where you see that the infotainment is important the gateway is important but each one of them has the, the the issue of ensuring safety security reliability reliability is over time hmm? uh, aspects of it of course there are more elements that, that we care about they are not our topic of interest for today that is the the, the software the machine learning the power aspect of them and so on and we see that other products besides the cars do also care about the same things. In avionics, which are also autonomous vehicles, industrial, which are also robots in industry, for instance, uh, or IoTs, small um, drones for your cameras and so on, they all have similar kind of missions. They are mission critical ones because they can create dangers for life. Therefore, we, we need to take care of them clearly. Now, if I look at the autonomous vehicles, especially on the automotive aspect of it, I see that the chips in the car, for instance, are not all the same. There are different categories of them. There are categories, if I go from the right-hand side, there is um, <coughs> the basic uh, controllers, if you want, that are sitting there. Then in the middle, I see infotainment and car-to-car -car communication. And then I have the driver assistance systems, ADAS, which is more the intelligence of the driver put into chips. But if I look inside the chip, coming from the IP industry, I like to, to look inside it and see what kind of boxes ne are needed. I would notice that some of the boxes are similar, some of the boxes are different. As we move forward, mm, uh, we see the complexity of those chips changing. The most complex of those are the ADAS chips. And ADAS chips need to have in them high-end processing power, they need to have artificial intelligence accelerator. They need to clearly have security and safety. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Lots of communication protocols talking to the outside world, outside the chip, I would say, whether it's MIPI for videos, HDMI, PCIe. Um, so lots of high-speed high file communication. And uh, the technology that is supplying all of this is changing quite fast changing in the sense that the newer ADAS chips were 
just a couple of years ago, 16 nanometer technology was good enough in terms of speed, area, power. Today is not. Uh, today we are already in the five nanometer, uh, which which will be an issue. We'll talk about it in a bit because uh, before the technology gets matured, we are already starting to use it in in mission critical applications such as self driving of cars. Okay. The others infotainment does not need that far so so today the infotainment chips can be at 16 or 14 nanometer again the gateway chips they can be also at 16 14 nanometer the most critical ones are the ADAS as I said because of the the, the AI aspect of it the speed that necessary for it we are forced to go to smaller and smaller technologies so today if I look at the ADAS chips I already see that about more than 20 percent of the chips today are already in five nanometer. Some are behind, of course, they're coming. But the infotainment and uh, the powertrain chassis sensors are still at earlier stage technology, meaning older technologies. Now, what is the difference between this if we compare it to another application? With the autonomous vehicles, the cars, the drones, and so on, uh, <clears throat> we have a range of technologies. If I compare it to mobile equipment, the range is, is smaller. We see that the design size uh, is slightly different, but most importantly for me, it is the conditions under which this is running. For instance, the temperature. If you are talking about your cars or drones, the range of temperature is much wider than your mobile phone, which is in your pocket or in your room and so on. So, so you're dealing with wider range from minus 40 to plus 155. Therefore, the preparation of that chip, its tolerance, its quality, its reliability should meet that. Also, the life cycle. The lifetime for, for mobile phones is much shorter than the lifetime for cars. Therefore, the, the lifetime uh, reliability, the aging aspects, and so on, are far more important in this mm -hmm. second case, okay? Uh, <clears throat> therefore, the, the, the failure target, mm, uh, we look at DPPMs that are zero, and we'll talk about that in a short while. So this is just to give you a feel about the, the two aspects. The, the most intelligent ones, as we said, are the ADAS chips, and the ADAS stands for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, okay? Now, with those chips, what happens is that the, the information is collected from the, the, the different uh, sensors around the car, uh, from the cameras to radars and so on, from the GPS. And that information is being collected, pre-processed initially, and then sent out during the day or overnight to the cloud. That's why we had this four terabyte of communication. But why did we do that? We did because in the cloud, we need to continue doing machine learning on it. So what we collect as information and pre-process it in the car and ship it in the uh, then in the cloud, there's a compute center where it gets interpreted and then sent back to the car to optimize the AI engine in the car. Okay. So the cars that have, the companies that have more cars in the streets, they collect more information. Therefore, they have much bigger data. Therefore, the, the interpretation is much more meaningful. Therefore, the self driving could be much more optimized specifically for that area where there are many cars that are using the same ml so being part of ml being part of artificial intelligence um, the car engines are also now the, the, the adas chips that is are part of the overall system for artificial intelligence which is quite large which is growing very fast as we know around the world because all the systems that we are using are becoming more and more intelligent and they are using more and more AI-oriented approaches for that. I will not concentrate on this too much. We can talk about AI some other time. AI is something that is being used in everything, in every company. In my company, where, where we do EDA tools, we use AI for, for multiple tools that we have. Instead of doing them only algorithmically, today we can use all the past data to optimize the next data, right? So we use all the learning from previous data, in order to shape the, 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 the future and move on with different types of tools. Also in the IP side of what we do, as we're building chips in the car, the IPs also need to be intelligent. 
and therefore the chips in the car do contain their AI corner. So it's not a single AI accelerator that, that is used today in the cars, but rather, for instance, the ADAS chip will have a corner of it doing uh, machine learning. The neural network uh, computation that's going on will be in a part of the car, and the rest will be processing it and making taking advantage of it. So the basic processing will happen differentiating between different types of objects and accordingly taking decisions, whether it's a person or a car or an animal or understanding the signs around you the, uh, uh, and the different aspects around the car mm, is done by image processing, by understanding them and using the, the neural networks inside the chip. Where does this put us? This puts us in a situation where we're using advanced technologies for the car, new nodes, mm, say five nanometer, and then the challenges of doing a chip in that domain is all the FinFET challenges that we have today. They are similar to everybody else. So we have all the uh, power, performance, area, yield challenges. But not only that, because of these autonomous vehicles, also we have safety as a challenge. We need to make sure we're at the right safety level, right reliability level, right quality level as we produce the chips, okay? But also the right security level because security, safety, reliability, and quality can, can any one of them can be at risk uh, if we're talking about this mission critical systems. So concentrating on those, we need to abide by measures, we need to abide by standards, make sure that the quality is fine so that the, the silicon life cycle, the chip throughout the life hmm, is done properly. And as we know, uh, the silicon to maintain the life. We just don't produce it in volume. Of course, we do the chip in volume, we produce it, we have to make sure that it's at the right quality level and so on. But we need to invest in that chip design <clears throat> early on to characterize it, to debug it. So we need to design the chip for characterization and debug. And later on, we need to build into our design capabilities to ensure power on self-test, to ensure periodic checking, to ensure real-time monitoring. All of these things could happen if during the design stage, we invest in the cars. So it's a silicon that goes in the car. It has a life cycle, but to manage that life cycle, we need to be able to invest. We call this long time ago, infrastructure IP, that is intelligent IP for DFX purposes. Uh, and the purpose of that infrastructure IP is maintaining the health of that silicon during the life cycle. Uh, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about safety, reliability, and quality, concentrate a little bit on each, and then we will see that these are all needed for the field eventually, but they are all incorporated in the design stage hmm, and then utilized later on hmm, uh, to take advantage of them. Particularly for these automotive designs or automotive equipments, what we need to do, we need to ensure very, very high quality production test. Okay, we'll talk about that to have zero DPPNs. Uh, we need to ensure that every time I power on my car, there is a power on self test going on mm, to ensure that nothing happened during the life cycle. And that's a reliability issue. Uh, no aging factors, or at least we can clean them as they come in. And then in the field, safety, security measures, and so on, for anything that could happen during mission mode, we need to contain them, we need to have tolerance for them, and so on. Okay. Um, as we are moving through the technology nodes, we see that those approaches are changing as well, and the stringency of those approaches. And we monitor. Hmm? At Synopsys, we look at how, how long each node will take, and how the first uh, 500 designs how did we ramp up? How fast did we ramp up? Some nodes are ramped faster, others not. Today, we are already in the three nanometer domain, okay? And to do that, we need to have solutions that match these, uh, that match the exact uh, nodes and to make sure that they reach the right DPPM level. And DPPM, by the way, means defective parts per million, okay? And that is one part per million can be escaped if the ppm is one but given the automotive situation today all the all the decision making that we are uh, converting we are transporting from 
from from human to machine, we need to have much better than one dpbm. We need to have uh, zero point something. So we are looking at measuring it by dpbb, that is defective parts per billion instead. Okay. To do that, of course, we have to go to every chip. To do that, we have to go inside the chip to make every block uh, intelligent enough to have the different safety, security, quality measures in them. And the chip is rich with many types of blocks these days. And this is one, one sample set, as we have seen earlier, also from different types. So what do we need to do? We need to think of an IP at a time. And as we are preparing that IP, built in the quality, hmm, all the self-testing, self-diagnosis, and so on, in advance in that. Make sure they are accessible via different systems. So, so it's not only isolated with its patterns, but the accessibility is there at the subsystem level, and also the accessibility is there at the SOC level. So accessibility is a key element. Now, depending on the box, we do different things. If I have a mixed signal IP, I need to have that mixed signal IP have all its self-test capabilities built in, in order for it to be self-tested, not upon manufacturing only, but also in the field later on. Okay, so all kinds of interface IPs that we do at very high speed files mm, that we produce, we make them each self-testable, we make them each uh, ready for diagnosis, for, for, for loopback modes, for, for characterization modes, and so on. Mm. And for that, we see that that complexity is going up constantly. We see that the, the high speed and the more complex uh, files, for instance, DDRs, USBs, and so on, have many, many pattern sets, whereas the small ones, the sensors, the monitors, will be simpler. Mm -hmm. The medium ones will be ADCs, DACs. So, so the complexity of, of that additional effort, additional intelligence put into those IPs will be a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Memories are the most complex, as you know, because they are very dense, and the number of memories is large in a given chip. And also the total bit count is quite high. Therefore, the yield as well as the reliability can get impacted with the memories. So that's why having a memory test and repair system intelligently uh, incorporated would be important. Mm -hmm. To deal with every memory, we need to wrap those memories. We need to process their test and repair algorithms, have access for, to do diagnostics with them and have capabilities outside to diagnose them. The problem is that those chips are shrinking and memories before everything else uh, are changing in their behaviors because different defects are acting in different ways. As we moved from planner technology to, to FinFAT technology, we saw that lots of new defects started to come in. We saw that there are certain defects stuck on to appear in the fins. We see fin opens, fin shorts, you know, one transistor is made of three fins typically. Um, how these three fins are working with each other, all the shorts between them as well. And this is changing. It's changing in the fact that as the, the fins are becoming, are moving from one node to the next, they're becoming taller and weaker, okay? Taller and weaker in a sense that we need to take care of them early on before they, they create problems. Mm -hmm. Where the fin height mm -hmm. keeps increasing, they are taller, but the fin width keeps shrinking, they're becoming narrower. And that's why with every technology node, today we are, we are at three nanometer, we need to understand their defectivity. We follow a certain uh, advanced inductive fault analysis method to, to inject defects and understand their behaviors to control that quality. And we see that the same defect, for instance, this particular defect, which is a resistive fin open defect, will act differently, will behave differently if I am in seven nanometer or four nanometer. If I'm in seven nanometer, detecting the same defect will take a particular sequence of operations in that memory. If I am in four nanometer and five as well, I will need another set, which is different. Therefore, from node to node, things are changing. Therefore, that's why in our case, what we do is we, we analyze every node. We started with 28 plan of technology to the first FinFET in 16. We moved to seven, we moved to five, and now three. 
And in each case, we create different test algorithms accordingly based on the injected defects and seeing their behaviors. And that's the, those algorithms, therefore, will go in and sit in an engine that will provide the solution for you. So these are all intelligent uh, efforts that have to be done all in advance. And as we're moving to newer technologies, moving from two-dimensional planner to FIMFAT, which was three-dimensional, and now to uh, gate all around, the GAA technology with nanowire, nano sheet, will again bring us new types of defectivity. We have to understand them. And the memories themselves also are going to three-dimensional. That also is a challenge that we need to look at. Now, all of these are added by repair aspects. We need to ensure that yield is good, and therefore repair is, is there in multiple ways, particularly in automotive. The repair has to be very fast. We have to accelerate the repair because when you power your, your car, you don't have time to wait in order to, to fix the, the, the yield aspect that is pre-programmed in your fuse box inside the chip. Of course, understanding defectivity is important as well uh, when you're dealing with new nodes. Again, for the automotive quality, we need to have all the diagnostic capabilities built in from understanding which memory is failing to understanding which exact location of defect is there. And this will allow us to see where are the defects and deal with them accordingly. And then analyze them, do visualization, do correlation, do statistics, and so on from there on. Now, let's not forget that we shouldn't only look inside the chip, but also there are memories outside the chip, uh, outside the SOC, outside the ADAS chip, which are DRAMs. Mm -hmm. To do that, we also need to, to interact to sit inside the logic die and do external memory testing, okay? So something we learned over time as well, if you have DDRs, if you have HVMs sitting outside, we need to sit the, put the engine in the SOC and test the memories externally. Again, to ensure that they are healthy, not only upon manufacturing, but also during the life cycle. Mm -hmm. Upon power up, every time I power up my, my, my system, my SOC will run the test and repair and test and repair all the memories, DRAMs connected to it as well. And then this entirety will do the job. So that we call it periodic testing, testing from time to time. Okay. On the logic side, uh, we also need to ensure the quality of the logic. Particularly in automotive, we need logic based because uh, it's not only the manufacturing, but also in the field, you need to, to test that logic. And to increase the coverage of logic based, we all know that we use test points. And those test points are based on analysis of my logic blocks, uh, either placement based or timing based. And I insert the test points and get very good coverage. So logic based at large has a couple of issues to be uh, looked at. One issue is the X tolerance aspect. We need to have good X tolerance. Second is the coverage aspect. We need to have test points to get high coverage. And the third is having multiple seeds. Mm -hmm. A single seed may not give us enough coverage. If I run multiple seeds, then I get much better coverage. See, this is with one seed, with five seeds, with 10 seeds. So therefore, we need to have an X-tolerant logic based solution, as we call it XLBIS, and uh, insert the test point in it in advance, and then have multiple seed, seeds manage to get the highest coverage possible for in-system testing. As we'll see later, in-system testing will have certain requirements. Each time you do your power on self-test, you need to have a certain level of, of uh, coverage to reach 99% uh, if you're shooting for ACT. Mm -hmm. That's why it, when we put everything together, whether they are the memories or the, the high-speed analogish blocks, all the logic blocks, we need to have all the engines prepared and managed via the hierarchy. And coming in manufacturing from the from the tab, the JTAC tab, exercise it and have the entirety work together. So this is all allowing me to do quality. Next is reliability. For reliability, what we have is we have a couple of issues. One is aging. So transistor aging is important. Therefore, aging monitors are needed. For, for these systems that have long life, cars 15 years or so. 
also reliability against soft errors is very important. Mm -hmm. And as we know, as we are shrinking the dimensions, uh, the, the memory bits are becoming much closer to each other. Therefore, multi-bit errors are happening much more. Mm -hmm. uh, for multi-bit errors to be detected, uh, we need to have and corrected. We need to have intelligent ECC systems that don't look at one error at a time, but rather can look at multiple errors that would have happened because one hit is causing multi multi error situations. So to do that, of course, we need to have uh, different codes that can do multi bit correction, and then you have an ECC that is intelligent enough to handle multi bit error correction. Also, the new standards are requiring more, where typically the error correction is at the uh, data level. Now we need address-wide also correction. We need also error injection capabilities to be added to our systems. So this is adding to the, to the solution, to the space of the solution much nicely. So ECCs for reliability are very good. Uh, having fit rate planning is important as well to get the right amount of, of ECC. You don't need to put ECC in all the memories at the same time and none of the memories as well. You can have a subset. For that subset, you need to do a proper planning to see which memory needs, how much uh, uh, amount of ECC, uh, no ECC at all, or, or detection only, or correction as well. So this gives you a view about the reliability as well. Finally, the third component is safety. Safety, as we know, is not something new. In the industry, we had safety for a long time, for mission critical, for medical, for machinery, for airplanes, and so on. And there were many standards. But recently, for uh, moving vehicles, we created this new standard called uh, 26262. It's an ISO standard. It's an ISO standard that has multiple levels, depending on the risk potential. It can be A level, B level, C, or D. The ADAS chips, the, the driver assistant chips, will be at the D level, for instance, okay, because they are critical systems for us. So self driving would require ACD, which is more stringent. If you're doing not self driving, but driver assistance only, then B level or C level would be sufficient, depending if it's a ra radar or a camera and so on. So those levels are incorporated into the design. So when I'm doing typically my design from top down and then my verification from bottom up, now I need to do more. I need to also have safety incorporated. So this ISO 26262 will require me, will uh, require that I go through all these tabs, okay, to incorporate the safety mechanisms, the safety features, and then have the safety manuals, the safety reports come out of it. And this is at every level from IP level to chip level and later. So to do that, I need to put certain mechanisms for safety. Uh, and we know these things. We know parity, we need protection, we need triplication, duplication. There is a menu of different possibilities of functional safety mechanisms. But I have to choose them. To choose them depending on what is more important for me. For instance, if I look at replication, doubling, tripling, triple modular redundancy, it's expensive, but it gives you much better tolerance, much better safety. Whereas if you do basic uh, detection or parity, it will give you less effectiveness. But depending on the situation, you need to, to decide in each one of your IPs how much of that to put and how much complexity to add to the IP in order to make it safe. As a result, I would see that my IPs will have certain protection mechanisms, such as detection and so on, redundancy, such as duplication, triplication, and many other ways of protecting them. So that's a science by itself, the, the safety mechanisms and how you fit them, for which we do have analysis tools and so on to make sure that they are well analyzed. And as a result, you get to the level necessary. Once you put all that, for each IP, you need to certify it officially by third party certification. And you need to have either ACL A, B, C, or D level. Hmm? This happens to be an ACD oriented uh, evaluation where it satisfies. Therefore, the user can take it 
and incorporate that IP inside the chip. Okay. So for every IP, when you build it up, it will give you necessary to go to the field. And now we have to use it in system and in mission mode. So in system, what do we do first? We do the power on. Every time I power on my chip, there I have to run all the self-test mechanisms that are there. The logic based, the memory based, the, the interface IP based, the analog based. And it will need to be run uh, one time with very high fault coverage. This is upon power up. But I will see that I need to do more than that as well. To do this, I need infrastructure. I need to have my different engines, hmm, the logic based, the memory based, and so on. But I need to have a scheduling manager such that I click it and everything runs smoothly, nicely with each other. Now, to do that, of course, I have to run different complexity algorithms. The complexity of the DPPM algorithm that I run in manufacturing for FinFET is not the same that what I will run during power up. It's much less, okay? So the selection algorithm that we do is lesser complexity. And later, when you will see periodic testing, even there it is, it is simpler or less complex because what you're checking periodically is not the aging faults or it's not the, the manufacturing faults, okay? So therefore, your memory-based engine need to have multiple algorithms built in. In the field, uh, when I'm in mission mode, I have two types of things. I have ECC, the error correction that we saw a little bit earlier. It is very important to have it fully done, but also transparent-based, which is periodic. That is running every so often, uh, the 26262 standard requires requires that we do it every 100 millisecond with 99% coverage. So all the blocks that have their base to run in a periodic way need to do that job on a constant basis when you are in the field, when you are driving your car. We have done some, some joint publications. This is one with, uh, with Intel about that specific aspect, about the periodic testing and how it works. So at periodic testing, we'd run one slice of the chip, then the next slice, then the next slice, uh, and then manage it all from the, from the engine that sits there. We call it the safety manager. <clears throat> safety manager, as you will see, it's a microprocessor needed for safety purposes, without which you cannot manage. I mean, you can have all of these engines sitting in there, but without managing them by a dedicated safety processor that will not be done properly. So this is running the first slice, the second slice, the third slice, depending on their mission mode. We have done some, some work and we published it with, with Bosch around those. So it shows how a central entity, a safety controller or a safety processor can come and handle each one of those blocks. Those safety processes are special. They have to be also lockstep uh, based, okay? So they are dual core with lockstep. They check against each other. This is one of the safety processes that we have in our family of ARC processors that do that checking, that have ECC in them, that have various capabilities, and they are dedicated to manage the safety aspects hmm? uh, upon power on, as well as periodically. Therefore, to, to, to look at it from a, from next level up, we see that that safety manager, or some people call it safety island, need to come in and through the APB port, talk to my total infrastructure, run my logic base, run my memory base, run my analog base, based on a given schedule uh, for the entirety. So all of these are very nice. However, I still have one more challenge. And that one more challenge is security. To ensure security, especially that we are connected to the outside world and the car through its infotainment system, for instance, can receive uh, hacking and can, which can may replace its embedded software, which may uh, impact my actuators. So I need to close the doors or secure the doors, right? And secure the doors at different times. During the running operation, during the mission mode, I have to continuously check for threats continuously check for communications. During the power on and power off modes, again, I need to make sure that during the power up, nothing is being interfering. Mm -hmm. uh, we validate the software, everything is, is correct. 
and also power off, nothing is being uh, stolen from my car when I am in power off mode. To do that, I need a trusted environment. So my final point is that the trusted environment needs another processor, hmm, which is for security purposes. We call it the root of trust processor. So a processor that sits inside the chip, separate from the safety processor, that allows us to secure the chip, that allows us to look at uh, the different runtime protection aspects, secure the storage, check the keys, do the recovery, uh, ensure the storage elements are properly controlled. So it's one corner of your SOC sitting on the bus, but controlling all the other traffic and especially the interfacing ports with the outside, okay? Well, all the high-speed interfaces or low-speed interfaces that we are open to, we have to make sure that the, the T-Root does that job. Now, T-Root also needs to look after the, the DFT or DFX infrastructure, because that DFX infrastructure can also uh, be a place for intrusion. Therefore, we have to lock it. We have to lock at this level, at that level, at that level, to allow only authorized entities to come in and access the chip when it's in the car, okay? So all these mechanisms need to be built in the car and accordingly, we need to control it. So finally, what do we need to do? We need to build inside our IPs all the necessary functions. We need to build the hierarchy to manage it, but we also need to have two on-chip processors in small intelligent capabilities, a safety island to ensure the safety, and then a root of trust to ensure the security. With that, I think we can cover the important aspects of our chips as we're putting them into a very critical mode. We can control the safety, the quality, and the security of them. And not only in the cars, but also in all the equipments that will be around us that are critical, so that have autonomy, that are moving around, and giving us the necessary uh, confidence. With that, I would like to, to ensure that we have the basic concepts of safety, security, quality, and reliability. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much, Yevan, for this uh, excellent uh, talk. Thank you. So uh, the ones that have questions, please uh, do it uh, as soon as possible using the chat uh, channel. But uh, to start, I have one. Yes, please. So um, uh, nowadays, uh, the amount of uh, the number of chips in a car is uh, very large, no? And then there is a lot of cables uh, connecting them. Uh, yes. And Cables is uh, also a source of uh, problems of reliability, you no? Know? So uh, how you see the possibility to reduce the amount of chips in a car to have only few ones? How you see these uh, possibilities, you no? Know, yes. With all this amount of cables and so on. That there are two aspects, and the, the, and the trend shows that we're moving in, in both directions positively. One is reducing the number of chips from the, instead of having many distributed controllers next to each system and so on, getting from those controllers to a centralized place. So to have less chips, to have them in centralized places to do all the judgments and compare the results to each other. So instead of having local decisions, have global decisions at the car level. However, that brings us to, to, this, to the main issue that you mentioned, the cabling. Uh, if these are all connected via cables, that will increase the, the amount of cable inside the car, which is not only a reliability issue, it's, it's also um, a complexity issue, it's also weight in the car and so on. So for that, we're starting to see cable-less, hmm, wireless co communication being adopted. I know of several companies that are even looking at using 5G inside the car using different communication protocols inside the car to be able to, to communicate uh, uh, in a different wireless protocols to ensure that communication does not require as much wires. Okay, thank you. 
So we have a question by uh, Professor Altamiro Suzin from UFRGS uh, here in Porto Alegre. Thanks for presenting these uh, hot topics. Many questions arise. For example, will it be feasible to route uh, four terabytes for each vehicle, or this is the maximum when possible dropping out if not connected? Um, it, it is. I mean, the, these days, the, uh, communicating for terabytes is not a major issue. Uh, it is doable. It may not be needed constantly, though. Hmm? The four terabyte that I mentioned is a daily basis to send your your experience to the cloud and receive back information from the cloud to to optimize your your uh, your weights on your network on your neural network. Uh, so these four terabytes of information does not need to be done constantly. It can be done if certain periods you're not connected, can be done later on. But there is a connectedness aspect of it also for, for infotainment, for directions and so on. Being connected is important. Mm -hmm. uh, that connection to the cloud is one aspect. The second aspect is the connection between the cars. Mm -hmm. for, for control, for, for safety, car-to-car -car communication is also important. Mm -hmm which is also a certain amount of data, but that's not a huge data between car to car. Thank you. So another question also by Professor Altamiro Suzin. Uh, I feel that the main concern in the talk was defects and faults, what means hardware security. How can we face validation at algorithm level in such complex application like autonomous machines? Yes. Uh, we definitely need to have it uh, not only at the hardware level, but also at the so Today, my concentration were on the chips and the health of the chips mm, uh, during that life cycle. But uh, we are not limited to that. At every layer, we need to ensure that it's particularly security and safety. There can the risk can be at at every level. Okay, so software security, software safety are very well studied fields. They are very critical. And therefore, we need to pay full attention to them as well. Thank you. So now I talk by Eric Tokuda from uh, University of Sao Paulo. How do you guys in Synopsis plan to handle this plateauing of the Moore's law? Uh, how do you plan to keep increasing processing power in small s smalls? Well, it, mm. um, Yes, more scale, I guess. Or um, yes, uh, Moore's law. We know that Moore's law, as it was defined, it stopped some time ago. Hmm? Um, even the FinFET nodes were not the pure CMOS nodes. They they have uh, special steps. They have special capabilities. As we move to GAA, will be even more. But I think one way of addressing uh, the Moore's law uh, need is not through shrinking the semiconductor technology, but also using uh, new ways of packaging technology. That is, uh, putting uh, different types of uh, functions in different pieces of silicon and packaging them together, whether in a two and a half or 3D manner. The chiplets today are, are uh, becoming uh, needed these days. Uh, so you don't put your entirety in one chip. There are two different uh, aspects of uh, this packaging. Either one very complex chip, you take it, you disaggregate it to multiple chips, uh, and you put them next to each other or above each other, and you create a function. Instead of trying to squeeze everything in a single SOC, you put, you put four of them together to do that function. That's it. Another way of doing it is mixing technologies. That is, you can make the, the processing engine with, with uh, three nanometer, mm -hmm. whereas you put other functions, the analogish functions and so on in other technologies, but still multiple dyes together. So in, in my mind, addressing Moore's law is not only by shrinking hmm, to go to the next node, next node, but also utilizing the multi-dye uh, packaging aspects of two and a half and three D. Thank you. So now a question by Amir Khan from uh, University of Seville in Spain. So latency issues will be severe for such scenarios. How to tackle then uh, when there is so much amount of data 
transfer and to identify the type event or information uh, it is emergency or uh, normal come um it, it depends on the uh, both so there is the the normal uh, communication is part of it with the regular information flow data flow that is going on that's being collected but also there is the emergency there are the warnings and the interrupts and so on so you, you have to see <clears throat> that if uh, a certain safety risk or safety uh, security risks happens then there are higher priority communications mm -hmm. uh, besides that there is the normal flow of, of data as well so it's a it's a mix of the two but the system that you're building has to be intelligent enough to handle multiple communications thank you now i question by professor tiago baling the head of the graduate program microelectronics uh, at the uh, ufrgs can you comment a little on electromagnetic interference in autonomous vehicles and what is done to mitigate besides shielding? Yes, uh, <clears throat> electromagnetic and many other factors that, that impact the health of the chip need to be taken care of. Now, if you, you, you do it particularly to one or the other, such as shielding, you have to, to be very direct to address different aspects. Um, one other way of looking at it is to go to the next level. For instance, when we talked about um, error correction, when we talked about uh, fault tolerance, when we talked about periodic testing and acting accordingly, all of these things are th things that could happen during the mission mode. And if you see any kinds of interference, whether by natural reasons such as these or by bad intentions such as the security ones we need to be protected for them okay thank you so another question by altamir suzin for ip interoperability it would be some standards in order to designers in order the designer could verify um i'm not sure that the question is very clear to me but <coughs> Uh, but the IP interoperability or in talking to the different IPs, yes, we need standards. Uh, of course, the IPs uh, themselves often uh, are based on standards, are based on standards because they have, they're using, let's say, USB communication, that's a standard, or the DDR, it's a standard, or they're using MIPI, which is a standard. So either they are using a standard to communicate for functional purposes, that's one for the health of that ip if i am communicating about its uh testability its reliability its uh, other methods so, so there are also standards to carry that information and to make the ips interoperable you know in the testability world we have multiple standards um i believe 1500 i believe 1687 are standard to access ips and to communicate with them and we utilize those for that purpose. So there are standards for functionality purposes and standards for DFX purposes. Yeah, as you can see, Suzin uh, changed a little bit the question, talking also about uh, the, the integration in the verification chain. No? Yes, th th there also you, you need to have uh, integration. You need to, to, everything that I mentioned need to come through the verification chain as well. In fact, uh, anything you are adding has to be uh, verified properly because you are adding to the complexity of the design. Gladly, we have nice ways of verifying the IP functions. Gladly, we have nice ways to verify the safety that we added or to evaluate the security that we added or to measure the quality, the testability, the coverage that we added. So all of that has its, its have their own verification mechanisms. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm not seeing any more question here in the chat. So if you have a, still have a question, please do it uh, now. Uh, but I have one. Uh, yes. So uh, so one point, uh, as you already told in the cars, is the reliability. And uh, so um, some cars uh, to increase the reliability, they use in some chips, not the most new technology, but some uh, older ones that are more reliable, no? 
So, so how you see this, uh, the use of uh, older and uh, newer technology in the cars? So maybe for some chips, uh, new ones, but uh, for a lot of chips, it's preferable to use uh, uh, older technologies that are more reliable, considering mainly in radiation effects, for example. Yes. So, yes, that that was the trend actually, Ricardo, for for a long time. The chips in the cars were not the most recent technology. The chips in the cars were always two, three generations before, behind, right? Because of exactly what you mentioned, the maturity. Uh, they were mature enough, therefore we were able to use them. Still, there are certain types of chips. Let's say the microcontrollers in the cars do not need to be five nanometer. They can nicely be 28 nanometer. Okay. So, so that is, that is continuing. Um, however, because of the intelligence that we added to the cars, all this self-driving needed, the AI for that needed, and so on, that requires much faster speed. Mm -hmm. And because you need faster speed, we we're forced to go to those newer technologies. So going to new technologies is not just for fun. They would have stayed in the older technologies typically. But those functionalities require much faster communication, much faster computation, much more memories, that's putting them into the newer nodes. Mm -hmm. And the problem there is that because these nodes are not mature enough, we had to do several other things, as I mentioned in my talk today, they were mostly due to the fact that we are using, we have to use the new technologies, but we have to add new uh, mechanisms to protect the chips, to maintain the health of the chip, right? Otherwise, if it was mature enough, as before, um, many of the things that I mentioned today may not have been necessary because they are using mature technology, stable technology, and so on, well protected. Okay, thank you very much, Ervan, for this very nice talk. I'm seeing no more questions here in the in the channel. Thank you. Bye bye. See you next Wednesday.